In the aftermath of Trump's victory, Obama says goodbye to Europe, embracing the last liberal standing, Germany's Angela Merkel. Ultimately, I remain uh, optimistic uh, about not just America's futures, but uh, the direction uh, that the world is going in. And part of what makes me most optimistic is if you look at the attitudes of young people. Good evening. As the Western world swings right, and after Brexit and Trump victories, Barack Obama has pointedly flown to indulge his real special relationship, that with Chancellor Angela Merkel, telling her that if she does run again in next year's German elections, if he were a German, he'd be voting for her. But like everyone else in Europe, she is besieged by a rising tide of right-wing populism, a populism that has brought Japan's Prime Minister, Abe, hurrying to Trump Tower in New York, the first foreign leader to meet Trump. Most immediately, Mr Abe is exercised by Trump's campaign rhetoric against Japan over free trade and underpaying for US forces on its soil. Also on tonight's programme, as Japan treads carefully with Trump, another Asian leader, President Duterte of the Philippines, thumbs his nose at the Liberal West with a threat to follow Russia and withdraw from the International Criminal Court. The Joe Cox murder trial hears how her killer blasted her with his gun before walking away seemingly without a care in the world. And as UKIP denies breaking EU spending rules at the last election, no we follow more. the motley crew bidding for the leadership and ask long-suffering supporters who they want. I want security and stability because we're here to stay and we're going forward. They seem to be dropping like flies and that's why I'm not sitting down the front, just in case I become leader. Also tonight, two great British performance poets on stage. John Cooper Clarke and Kate Tempest, punk, meets hip-hop in London. I find that the same poem means a completely different thing. The same set of lyrics means completely different things in yeah. different environments. I tell you what, I never stop altering them. It's never finished, only abandoned. It's his farewell tour of Europe, but Barack Obama was keen to use his last appearance alongside the German Chancellor Angela Merkel to put down a marker for his successor, warning Donald Trump to be ready to stand up if Russia, if need, to Russia if needed. Speaking in Berlin, the president said that Mrs Merkel had been his closest international partner during their years in office. Our foreign affairs correspondent Jonathan Rugman has this report. In downcast Berlin, they are bidding farewell to a liberal president on his swan song trip to an increasingly less liberal Europe. Barack Obama says Angela Merkel is his closest international partner. By contrast, Donald Trump's closest ally in Europe is probably Nigel Farage. And Germany's chancellor is surely desperate for this president's intelligence on what his successor might do next. As Ukraine test fires brand new missiles, the Germans and the Americans are trying to preserve an uneasy truce with Russia. But they're worried a Trump administration will put sanctions against Moscow into reverse. In Syria, where scores were killed in airstrikes today, they wonder if Mr. Trump will take a less tough line against Russia as well. But if Mr. Obama was trying to reassure his German ally, it also sounded as if he was trying to change his successor's mind before it's too late. My hope is that the president-elect coming in uh, uh, takes a similarly constructive approach, finding areas where we can cooperate with Russia, where our, our values and interests align, but that the president-elect also is willing to stand up to Russia where they are deviating from our values and international norms. Flashback to 2008. Mr Obama, then a rock star presidential candidate, wooing Berlin in the mold-breaking footsteps of President Kennedy. It was eight years ago. Uh, I had no grey hair. Chancellor Merkel was in power back then as now, and you sense today that it wasn't just her ally's hair 
which couldn't be replaced. This is the end of an eight-year cooperation that was very close indeed. We have shared those values, we continue to share those values, and obviously we will continue to cooperate with the new administration. But today, I think a word of gratitude is at hand. Thank you very much for this very close, very intensive cooperation. Mrs. Merkel may announce in the next few days that she will run again for a fourth term next year. Four million more Germans are now in work than 11 years ago. And from Mr. Obama, this outspoken endorsement. Yeah, if, if I were here and I were German and I had a vote, I might support her. <laughs> but it's, I don't know whether that hurts or helps. Yet thousands of migrants and refugees continue to flock to Europe's shores. Over 400 disembarked in this Italian port yesterday, and Germany's leader risks paying a political price for opening her country's doors. In Austria, Norbert Hofer may become the EU's first far-right head of state in a rerun of presidential elections early next month. Whenever the elites distance themselves from voters, he said yesterday, then those elites will be voted out of office. And who would rule out the chances of Marine Le Pen? The Front National leader launched her campaign for French president this week, buoyed first by Brexit and then by Donald Trump. I'm convinced the French people will follow in Britain and America's footsteps, she said. Before asking, what is the point of NATO? From Mr. Obama today, there was this warning and rebuke to the UK for leaving the EU. I reiterated our hope that negotiations over the United Kingdom's exit from the EU will be conducted in a smooth and orderly and transparent fashion. The EU remains one of the world's great political and economic achievements, and that those achievements should not be taken for granted. I remain optimistic for the world's direction, he said, but these torchbearers for liberal, globalized, open border democracy know that in many places the arguments are not going their way. Jonathan Rugman reporting there. Now, in 63 days, Donald Trump will be sworn in as President of the United States of America. But who will he take to the White House with him largely remains a mystery, aside from two appointments. The Trump transition team says there's no chaos, it's all under control, even making time today to host the first world leader to have an audience with the president-elect. Our Washington correspondent, Kylie Morris, reports. The first world leader to bow before President-elect Trump will be the Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. I'd like to build trust with the US President-elect Trump and moreover work together for prosperity and world peace. They'll meet at Trump Tower in three hours' time. It's not clear whether the Prime Minister will have to wait for the lifts with the pizza delivery guy to get his face to face, but this is a no-protocol zone, strictly unofficial. After all, Mr. Trump isn't the president yet. Only because we're very deferential and respectful of the fact that we already have a president of the United States, uh, Barack Obama. He's on his last foreign trip of his presidency, and these meetings are much less formal than they will be once Donald Trump is sworn in as president. Death fell from the sky and the world was changed. In May, when Barack Obama became the first sitting U.S. leader to visit Hiroshima since America dropped the atomic bomb that destroyed the city, Donald Trump was anything but deferential and respectful. It's pathetic. So he's in Japan, in Hiroshima, and that's fine. Just as long as he doesn't apologize, it's absolutely fine. Who cares? In truth, no one knows what Abe and Trump will discuss at their Trump Tower meeting. Very few, including the president-elect's own campaign, expected to be on the cusp of taking power. Diplomats of every stripe are hunting for access and second-guessing what the new president might do. Stand up against the establishment. His old ally, Nigel Farage, has already dropped by Trump Tower. It's not clear when he'll meet the British Prime Minister. Trump reportedly told Theresa May on the phone that if she was travelling to the US, she should let him know. Others describe the call as confirming that Mr Trump is keen to engage with the British leader and soon. Australia resorted to golf diplomacy, getting a personal phone number for Trump from the golfer Greg Norman. In diplomacy and politics, you use lots of networks. 
While the world works out how to deal with Donald Trump as president, Hillary Clinton is coming to terms with her loss. In her first public appearance since conceding, she admitted it had come as a blow. There have been a few times this past week when uh, all I wanted to do was just to curl up with a good book or our dogs and never leave the house again. I know that over the past week, a lot of people have asked themselves whether America is the country we thought it was. America is worth it. Our children are worth it. The country America becomes will not only depend on Donald Trump, but his vice president-elect, Indiana Governor Mike Pence, and these people too, meet the predominantly white, predominantly male Republican congressional membership, squeezed in for a smiling selfie with the next Veep today. All doubts about the Trump ascendancy forgotten, Congress now belongs overwhelmingly to them. Kylie Morris joins us live now from Washington. Kylie. Well, it's now more than a week, John, since America chose Donald Trump and its next president, and it's been quite a ride already. I think here's the overarching question, which we don't yet have any answers to, but we're getting hints. Is President Trump going to be like candidate Trump and take a wrecking ball to current policy, wage a war on the media, trample over established conflict of interest norms, or is he going to take a more familiar establishment approach? So on Iran, for example, does he really undo the whole nuclear deal as he promised on the campaign? Or does he find a way to build on what already exists to make it a better deal? I mean, look at these key appointments, the only ones we have so far. Steve Bannon, the provocateur from Breitbart, and Reince Priebus, the establishment Republican. One of each there. So it's attention. And I think that's why there's such impatience about who he puts in cabinet. It will indicate the path that he is favoring, or perhaps there's attention that will be carried on throughout his entire four years. I mean, let's remember, very few people imagined he would actually win this thing, even on his own campaign. So the transition is not only bumpy for them, but for everyone trying to read the runes of how President Donald J. Trump will change America and the world. Kylie Morris in Washington. And later in the programme, we'll be hearing from one of the champions of the new alt-right backing Donald Trump, Milo Yiannopoulos. John. The Philippines' President Rodrigo Duterte says his country may become the latest to withdraw its support from the International Criminal Court. That court was set up to try, to, to try war crimes and crimes against humanity, but a growing number of countries have been announcing their withdrawal, including three African countries and, yesterday, Russia. And a warning, this report from our Asia correspondent, Jonathan Miller, does contain images from the very start, which some viewers may find distressing. He had vowed bloody carnage in his war on drugs, and President Rodrigo Duterte has steadfastly delivered on his promises, unleashing death squads in a dirty war which has left 4,000 dead since July. His response to critics, brash and bellicose. Barack Obama branded the son of a whore and told to go to hell. The UN told to f off and shut up. Today, the executioner president rounded on the International Criminal Court. Its chief prosecutor last month expressed deep concern over the extrajudicial killings, which it said could fall under its jurisdiction. They're useless, the International Criminal Court, he said in a mix of Tagalog and English. The Russians withdrew, he said, I might follow. If China and Russia moved to create a new world order, he said, he'd be the first to quit the UN and sign up. The United Nations had failed to stop wars, he said. The killing is endless. The mouth is spluttering. Yesterday, in a decree signed by Vladimir Putin, the Kremlin withdrew its support for the Hague-based Global Court after the ICC criticised its annexation of Crimea. Chief Prosecutor Fatou Bensouda said the court was closely monitoring instances of incitement and violence in the Philippines. So Duterte, who doesn't like being threatened, has now followed suit. The gun-slinging maverick 71-year-old Duterte with his notorious hair-trigger temper projects himself as a no-nonsense tough guy. He says his hero is Putin and that he now wants to buy guns from him, not America. But is all this bombast for real or just rhetoric?
For decades, the Philippines has had a defense pact with the United States, the two stage annual war games. But on his first foreign foray to China, Duterte announced separation from the US. He was sick of being America's doormat, he said. The next day, he reneged. I hadn't really meant that, he said. I don't give a to them. They are the ones interfering. You know what? It was in a profanity-laced rant in August that he first mooted leaving the United Nations. The next day, he said he'd been joking. <laughs> Philippine jails are jam-packed with addicts who've turned themselves in, fearing they'll be next on the kill list. The ICC now has Rodrigo Duterte in its sights. He may not like that, but pulling out now would not get him off the hook if it does go after him for having incited mass murder. Jonathan Miller. Now, the bombardment of eastern Aleppo has continued today, with dozens reported dead. We hear reports that the bombing has intensified even in this past hour. There are also warnings of an acute lack of fuel and food in the besieged city as winter approaches. Another dark day in East Aleppo. This is the Al Ansari district where three are reported to have died on the third day of renewed bombardment. <laughs> Reports from across the besieged city suggest dozens of people have died today. <laughs> This video shows the white helmets resuming their work. Here, freeing six-year-old Mohammed from rubble after four hours' work. Allahu Akbar! Allahu Akbar! Allahu Akbar! The humanitarian situation in East Aleppo continues to deteriorate with reports of food shortages. Safe corridors for civilians to escape repeatedly offered by the Syrian government as late as last week, went unused. Allahu Akbar. As the sense of mistrust between parties in this conflict continues to deepen. Now, he's long been a controversial figure in the history of the Hillsborough Stadium disaster. Now, Norman Betterson, then a chief inspector in South Yorkshire Police and later to become chief constable of Merseyside and West Yorkshire, has published a book giving his side of the story. Mr. Betterson is under investigation by the Independent Police Complaints Commission and could even face charges over his alleged involvement in a cover-up of police failings. So the move has angered the families of those who died in the crush. Our chief correspondent, Alex Thompson, reports from Liverpool. Sir Norman Betterson is trying, he says, to clear his name as a scapegoat for Hillsborough, a word he uses in his book. In Liverpool, Survivors of the Hillsborough disaster and the families of the 96 who died are appalled. I, th I think it's his ego. He's, he's a narcissist. It's all about him. Lifelong Everton him. fan Steve Kelly they, lost his brother Michael at Hillsborough, you know, you know, a Liverpool works, supporter. This book is, is his way of, again in my opinion, satisfying his ego that he was clear of everything. He wasn't. There's a cloud hanging over Norman Betterson. And the cloud is Hillsborough, and he's trying to eradicate it by giving a concocted story of I'm innocent of. That Hillsborough cloud certainly exists for Betterson. He's a suspect interviewed under caution by the police watchdog. Their papers will go to the Crown Prosecution Service before Christmas. I'd like, amongst other people, I'd like the Crown Prosecution Service to also have available my narrative. And that hasn't necessarily been made available because it doesn't fit with some of the more popular ones. What I'm inviting people to do is, if they're going to denounce me and if they're going to, uh, to, to uh, uh, strip me and flail me and, um, uh, and, and, and make me a monster, what I'd like people to do is be clear and be specific about what it is that they think I've done. In his interview and in his book, he vehemently denies there was any conspiracy or cover-up as the police prepared their case for this man, Lord Justice Taylor. His Hillsborough inquiry blamed the police for the disaster. This document came to light in Norman Betterson's handwriting. It's asking for a police statement to be altered. But he insists this was not a cover-up. 
The central purpose of his book is to show, as he sees it, there was no police cover-up after the Hillsborough disaster. And yet, when we repeatedly asked him how it could be that hundreds of statements were doctored without there being a conspiracy, he declined to answer. The process was a lawyer-led process in which police officers were used to uh, get the officer, officer to transpose an aid memoir into a statement. Now, the, but let's, you, let's, you, let's, can, you can dress up, you can dress no, up no, language. I'm, I'm not so, dressing anything well, up. Well, respect, I, I think you well, are. The statements got changed. What, what that I, is a matter right. of fact, which you Actually, have difficulty accepting. What, no, what I, no, what I can say is this. Well, you do have no, difficulty no, accepting. No, I don't. I don't at all. They well, were changed. Right, thank right. you. Now, my what, question is this. Given you accept they were changed, that had to be done in an organised fashion between the police and their lawyers. No, my account well, was... It, was my, it wasn't my, a statement, fairies. It my, happened. My account was changed. Let me tell you about my account. No, I'm, as, I'm, no. <laughs> I'm asking you about 116 no. accounts. No, well, let me tell you this. That That's is what still, I'm asking you That's about. still subject of the full and forensic investigation by the IPCC. The only thing mm. that I can tell you... You with, have difficulty with, addressing the, this, the only, don't you? No, the only thing I can tell you with any certainty is I wasn't involved, and what I saw, what I witnessed wasn't a clandestine plot to, uh, to corrupt the evidence that went to the Taylor inquiry. Outside his beloved Anfield, Richie Greaves, a survivor of the Hillsborough crush. He's already read the book carefully. He doesn't mention uh, the blood alcohol levels that were taken from survivors as they lay injured in the, in the hospital beds. Um, so basically anything that points the finger at South Yorkshire Police or embarrasses them in any way, or him in any way, is not mentioned in the book. Mr. Betterson's caused further anger on Merseyside, though, because his book criticises the universally praised Hillsborough Independent Panel for not being independent. Moreover, if only to dismiss them, he again raises the lies that Liverpool fans arrived drunk and late and contributed to the disaster. And that seems bizarre for a man who claims... In the book, I accept, and I do it in the preface, and I repeat it throughout, I accept that the, um, uh, the, the logistics tailor got it right 27 years ago. The main cause of the disaster was a failure of police control. This afternoon, Waterstones told us they will not stock this book. They said every buying decision we make is based on the quality of the book. Alex Thompson, Channel 4 News, Liverpool. The government says that the number of new homes built has risen by more than 10% in a year to nearly 200,000. But the new figures show that the number of those houses which are classed as affordable is at its lowest in 25 years. The total, 32,110, was less than half of that recorded in the previous year and the lowest since 1991-92. Simon Brown has been to Folkestone. When you have a home, you, there's all these little things that you do as a kid in your family home. You know, you've all stood up against the wall, you've drawn, you know, your height and your age and your name and you, you see you, your kids grow. Um, you don't have those little things. You can't do that when you're constantly moving around. Tell me how many times you've had to move house over the past 15 years? In the last 15 years, this is the 11th house that we've lived in. 11 times? Yes. That's a lot of times. How come? Um, a number of reasons. It's been varying time scales. Some places we've been there for six months. Some we've been lucky enough to um, stay sort of for two, three years. Um, but yeah, it has been hard. What Emma wants is the stability of her own home for her young family. But has the ladder been kicked away for those on low and middle incomes? The government say that the number of new homes has risen by over 10% in a year to nearly 200,000. But the number of affordable houses being built is at its lowest level in almost a quarter of a century. In 2014, there were over 66,000 affordable houses built. But in the last year, that figure halved to just over 30,000 affordable homes. Because the housing crisis has been going on for so long, we haven't built enough houses, we haven't fixed the rental market for so long, and that means that so many more people are being drawn into not being able to afford it. Uh, wages are, haven't kept up with the rental inflation, or uh, and many people can't afford to buy their own home now, so they haven't got that security. So across the board, uh, young families, 45 to 55 year olds, it's spreading right across the country. Our housing market is part national obsession, part national scandal. 
Despite the plethora of schemes to spur first-time home ownership, there are surprising groups being squeezed between the rising cost of home ownership and the rising cost of rents. Well, it's certainly true that a wide range of groups are experiencing housing unaffordability, but there are certain risk factors. So, for example, being a private renter, being a young person and living in the capital or the southeast. But we also see some unusual suspects, if you like, who are experiencing higher housing unaffordability. So we particularly looked at older people who were single and we saw that their incidence of housing unaffordability had increased significantly over time. Emma's household earns £24,000 a year without tax credits included. But the average income of those who've used the government's help to buy equity scheme is counted at over £40,000. So do you think it's, it's possible that you may never own your own home? I think, yeah, definitely. There's definitely a possibility there because if you look at all the figures and, you know, affordable housing is decreasing, that's not on our side. Um, and I am doing everything I can so I can buy my own home. Um, but yeah, it does feel like the system is against us. Now, the UK Independence Party has denied that it has misspent EU funds on polls during the 2015 general election campaign in Britain and ahead of this year's EU referendum. An audit of money spent by the Alliance for Direct Democracy in Europe, with which UKIP is linked in the European Parliament, raised the allegations, which come at a difficult time for the party, with the result of its latest leadership contest now less than two weeks away. Michael Crick is in Westminster. Michael. Well, the Alliance for Direct Democracy in Europe is an EU-wide political party set up by Nigel Farage a couple of years ago. It does involve MEPs from some other EU states, but they're overwhelmingly UKIP MEPs, two-thirds of them. Now, they're accused in this report from the European Parliament, leaked today to Sky News, of misusing European funds to carry out opinion polls in UKIP target seats at the last election. Thurrock, Rochester, Grimsby and South Thanet, where, of course, Nigel Farage himself uh, was a candidate, and also opinion polling ahead of the referendum. Now, if this report is ratified on Monday, it could mean that UKIP has to repay £150,000 to the European Parliament and will be deprived of future funding, uh, something which will cause them uh, financial problems uh, right now. The Labour MP Stephen Kinnock says that if they have been using EU money for party campaigning purposes, then that is defrauding the taxpayer. So something of a headache for the next UKIP leader who is due to be announced later this month. I have been following the leadership contest. On a moonlit wet night in Wolverhampton, the clip-clop at the racecourse is UKIP members coming to eye up the runners to follow Nigel Farage. One of four hustings nationwide that began in London just over two weeks ago. UKIP policy isn't to bring back the death penalty or reduce the, the limit of abortion at all. You seem a bit sensitive about this. I never said it was. Ah, well, <laughs> pe people keep repeating it, Dabby. Well, what do you think? No, I don't want to bring back the death penalty. Absolutely not. It doesn't work. Suzanne Evans, the main challenger to the favourite. Paul Nuttall. Why, why do you want Paul Nuttall? Well, because I want safe, I want security and stability because we're here to stay and we're going forward. I'm supporting Suzanne Evans. Why is that? I believe she has the uh, policies and the charisma on the TV to take the party forward. Until I know what their policies are, uh, which way they will bend with the wind... Um, I bend with the wind? Are you suggesting that UKIP candidates bend with the wind? Shame well, on you, sir. I, I've, uh... <laughs> I've come here to find out who to support because uh, they seem to be dropping like flies and that's why I'm not sitting down the front, just in case I become leader. Suzanne Evans was a Tory councillor in London till defecting to UKIP barely three years ago. Suzanne Evans. She soon became a skilled media performer and her recent call for democratic control of judges caused quite a stir. I was dubbed a fascist by none other than Anna Soubry. <laughs> <laughs> Gary Lineker called me stupid. Well, I reckon it's not half as stupid as missing that penalty against Brazil in 92. 
Paul Nuttall, MEP, former history lecturer and for six years deputy leader, is a pugnacious working class scouser. I'll crack heads together and ensure that we are a unified party. And let me make this clear. If people don't want to sign up on this, my history as party chairman tells you what I will do. I will come down on you like a ton of bricks. OK? It's as simple as that. The bloodshed and chaos since the June referendum triumph has been beyond belief. In five months, UKIP has lost Nigel Farage, elected Diane James, lost Diane James, revived Nigel Farage, had an altercation in the European Parliament between two of its MEPs, or a punch-up, depending on whom you believe, and now lost more than half of its new leadership candidates. Uh, we're just tourists. Nigel Farage's visit to President-elect Trump in New York last weekend reflects UKIP's biggest divide. I used to work here when I was a sort of teenager. What were you doing? The day before, Suzanne Evans took us round the market in Shrewsbury, her hometown. Who would you have supported, Trump or Hillary? I would have gone for Hillary. Yeah. Right. Does Donald Trump worry you? Some of the things he said and some of the stories that came out about him during the campaign were very worrying. But I was heartened by his acceptance speech, what, what which I think What was very worrying showed, during the campaign? Oh, the, the, the sexism, the misogyny, um, the, 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 his arrogance. You don't see UKIP as, uh, as Donald Trump Mark II? Um, I mean, look, 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 Nigel look, Farage look, look, clearly, yeah. you know, is look. a Donald Trump fan. No, 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 hang on. Some of the things Donald Trump was saying were right. Uh, and I do like the whole anti-establishment movement. What I felt with Donald Trump was that it was the right messages, wrong candidate, OK? And I do think UKIP can tap into this anti-establishment feeling because it isn't just in America, it's right across the Western world. And I want UKIP to be that vehicle in this country. The Farage camp seemed to grow wary of Evans with the praise she got at last year's manifesto launch. When she joined the cross-party vote leave group, some in UKIP suspected her at heart of still being a Tory. Where, where are you different from the Conservatives? I'm very different from Theresa May in that uh, she very much believes in big state, uh, nanny intervention. And she wouldn't say that. Spending more money on the state. Oh, I think she has. She made it very clear in her, in her first speech that she was very much in favour of uh, the state, the sort of state top-down control issue, which I fundamentally well, we disagree with. we haven't seen it yet. <laughs> well, give her time, give her time. She mentioned it in her speech. You know, for me, I think the state's too big, it's too nannying. I'm, I'm very much a libertarian in the sense of live and let live. I believe strongly in personal responsibility. But I think, I think there's far too much control in our lives. Paul Nuttall, who's fought seven elections in the North West, claims he can bring working class Labour voters to UKIP. When you've got a leader who refuses to sing the national anthem, when you've got a shadow foreign secretary who sneers at our flag and you've got a shadow chancellor who said nice things about the IRA, it isn't chiming well with people in working class communities. And look, people in working class communities now look at the Labour Party and look at the politicians and say, do you look like me? Do you act like me? Do you really represent me? A lot of politics is about empathy. I genuinely believe, with me, people in Labour, working class communities can empathise. What you're actually trying to there do... There is, though, is a third contender in this fight, Jonathan Rees Evans, who walked out of the Welsh hustings, underlining his position as outsider. I'm going to leave them to it, to you know, shout out their rousing platitudes. Suzanne Evans, remarkably, was out in the cold too this summer, suspended from UKIP for six months, accused of disloyalty. But she had no thought of going back to the Tories, she says. I had a lot of, lot of people ask me, a lot of Did people they? approached me. Who oh, approached gosh, yeah. you? Oh, lots of people. What, big people? Yeah. What, ministers and people in Downing oh, Street? Oh, possibly. Possibly? Like whom? I'm not telling you who. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't, do they, I don't do they snitch. Did they make you offers? I don't snitch. Do they? No, they just asked me to come back. No. no did they say, well, you know, we'll put you in the Lords and you? No, can... of course not. No, no, no. But did, it's... did it get that far? No. No, it was just informal stuff. No, it wasn't anything serious. And I just laughed. I said, no, been there, done that, got the T-shirt, doesn't fit anymore. Now, there's not a single hair on your head. And don't you look like a sort of skinhead <laughs> refugee from the BNP? <laughs> Oh, come on. 
That's a bit unfair. Well, I, mean, I mean, you had a beard uh, this summer. I did have a beard. And that made you look sort of Listen, uh, cuddly and sort of academic. Yeah. And now you've shaved it off again. Yeah. Don't you think that might be people fight a bit off-putting? I think, sort uh, of... Well, I think you may find after Christmas the beard might be back. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I think I'll be a chickpea. It'll be better. I'll be a chickpea candidate. The contrast between these contenders is more <laughs> image nine, and appeal than policy or ideology. I quite like hats. UKIP members are now voting. Does that make me even more Tory? And hope the winner, announced a week on Monday, will last longer than 18 days. Yeah. Well, now, a little earlier, I spoke to the UKIP MEP Roger Helmer from his East Midlands constituency about today's report from the European Parliament that the party had used EU money on domestic UK activities, and I put the point to him. We took EU money to spend on the purposes for which that money was given to us and for the same purposes which other political groups uh, use that money, which is brought for the broad promotion of their political stance without campaigning for individual parties and also for work like polling work. And we lent over backward to make sure that we conform to parliamentary rules. We hired not one but two compliance officers with years of experience working in the parliament with the parliament rule book. They signed off every piece of expenditure. And frankly, they're amazed, they're flabbergasted that the parliament is now turning down those pieces of expenditure, particularly as other political groups, pro-European groups, do very similar things and they get their expenses signed off. This is clearly a hostile campaign against Eurosceptic groups. It's clearly a perfectly defensible report from the EU Parliament, the European Parliament, uh, and it, uh, alas, it seems to indicate that your two compliance officers have fallen down on the job. Well, no, it is not a defensible report. Uh, in fact, we saw the main substance of their questions and complaints some time ago. Uh, and our lawyers have written a 14-page, point-by-point letter picking up each of the individual complaints that they've made and explaining why they are mistaken and providing documentary evidence where necessary. And the shocking thing is that they have simply ignored that. In their document, they don't even attempt to respond to the defence that we put in place. They have simply carried on making the same false assertions that they have been making all the way through. And I may say that for some months they've been treating our ADDE staff in an extraordinarily aggressive and hostile way, uh, which I think uh, makes a mockery of their claim. Uh, to be a, a Europe of values and of freedom and democracy. Well, that is almost certainly because you completely failed to address what they were saying, which was that you were using monies which all the groups in the European Parliament are about to use for European business. The word European, the word Europe, has not yet appeared in your defence. Now, I mean, what's going on here? Did you or did you not spend European parliamentary money on a domestic British campaign and more than one? No, we absolutely did not. And we have made it clear. We've produced affidavits regarding the people involved. What we've done is to do what all political groups in the European Parliament do. For example, we spent quite a lot of money on polling, as other groups do. Uh, and we made that information available publicly to all politicians and media outlets in Britain and across Europe so the suggestion that we did this purely for the benefit of a particular political party is entirely mistaken. Roger Helmer, thank you very much indeed for talking to us. My pleasure. Now to return to the changing political times in the US and the rise of the so-called alt-right under President-elect Trump. His appointment of Steve Bannon, the former chairman of the website Breitbart News, as his chief strategist, sent a strong signal of his future direction. Just before we came on air, I spoke to Milo Yiannopoulos. He's a senior editor at Breitbart News, and there's even been speculation that he, too, could find his way into the Trump White House. I began by asking him what exactly alt-right means. Well, it's a very young, vibrant, exciting new movement of conservatives in America. They are populists, they're nationalists, which is not a dirty word in America. Uh, they care about immigration, they care about trade, and they really hate political correctness. 
And you would describe yourself as one of those sort of cheerleaders. Of no, the, the media is desperate to crown me the queen of it. All I've ever done as a reporter is give them a fair hearing, give them a fair crack of the whip in the press. Um, for that crime, I have been called all sorts of awful names. Uh, but... but they're too extreme even for you, though. Uh, no, I wouldn't say that. I just We're fellow travellers on some issues, but, you know, they're, I'm very pro-Iraq, I'm very pro-Israel. There are all sorts of, you know, points of difference, I think. Do you think your erstwhile boss, uh, Steve Bannon, um, chairman of, of Breitbart and Trump, now Trump's chief strategist, do you do you think he has horribly regressive uh, attitudes? He's been described by some liberals and anti-Semite, a white nationalist. Have they got that wrong? Uh, well, Breitbart is a company staffed almost entirely by Jews. I am a gay Jew, and he made me into a star. He, you know, flew over to, uh, you know, flew over from America to hire Raheem, uh, Raheem Kassam to run the London office, who is a, you know, brown-skinned Muslim. Um, this stuff is ridiculous. What a lot of Brits don't always understand is how ugly and uh, terrifying American politics can be. The name-calling can be absolutely extraordinary. And, and lots of Brits... And name-calling by Breitbart. I mean, that is ugly. No, Look no, at these no. headlines. Well, no, Would asking... you rather your child had feminism or cancer? Well, that's not Steve, There's that's no mine. hiring <laughs> bias against women in tech. They just suck at interviews. That's, that's also... extreme. That's ugly. No, it's not it? extreme. They're my headlines. They're not Steve's. Um, and, How you know, are they not would, extreme? Would you rather your, fa your child had feminism or cancer? Well, Women agree with me. I mean, 7% of British women describe themselves as feminists. Just 7. It's only journalists who are still feminists. Feminism is versus, actually about... Versus... Feminism, versus, feminism, yeah, feminism is about feminism equality, is about, of course. About, you know, they you say don't, you one don't thing, believe that. You're redefining say, it. Well, no, they say one thing and they behave very differently. Feminists right, so, like to say, when they're on the defensive, oh, don't you believe in equal rights? But the way they actually behave is nasty, vindictive and Do you believe and in equality for women? Well, do you believe course, in equality Of course, any women? normal person does. I want right, women so to you're actually a feminist, then. Well, I, but I look, would describe myself as a second-wave feminist, but the modern version of feminism this ugly, uh, sociopathic, vindictive, mean, spiteful third-wave feminism, which, right. you know, which is defined by misandry. Okay. Women agree with me, not with you. Donald Trump has talked about governing for all Americans, mm -hmm. and yet Breitbart, his chief, the chief strategist now, has these extreme, divisive headlines. Do you I don't understand why people are fearful about no, I, the no. divisions that are being caused? No, I don't that. agree at all. Actually, what we do is we do something quite rare in journalism these days. We publish satire, we publish provocation, we publish all kinds of journalism that, that traditionally would have been left-wing. You know, the sorts of dissident, mischievous... Uh, you know, thought-provoking kind of stuff where you're like, well, wait a minute. Okay. Then you read it and you think, oh, actually, well, that's changed my mind. Right, isn't so... It, so it don't you find... No, I want to put, you... I want to put some of that satire don't to you. you. Find, I want to put some you of your own satire to you. Wait a minute. News, I know, I know, you, I know you want right women wing. to log off the internet, Suppo but we are now in the Channel 4 evil, News studio. Right so you have to allow me to speak. You said that women offended online should log off. You said, yes, we'll certainly let women onto the men's internet a few times a year, as long as you follow a few basic rules. You, can't you said, you can't wait, let me finish. You said, you mass Muslim immigration must stop or people will know real rape culture. Are we supposed to just soak that Am up I and wrong? take it as one big joke? Am I wrong about joke? that? Am I wrong about that? Answer me. Am I wrong Are we about supposed that? to just soak it Am up and take that? it as one big joke? You're supposed to treat it as it's intended and not wrench it from context. You know perfectly well that it is a provocation designed to make people think and perhaps to make them laugh. The guy who is behind all this provocation, the guy who hired you and turned you into a star, as you put it, is now chief strategist in the White House. What does mm -hmm. it mean that someone who delighted in offending people, who delighted in having a laugh at Muslims and women, is now people. at the centre of power. I delight in offending people. I think the grievance brigade, victimhood, you know, the idea that hurt feelings are some kind of special currency, I think that needs to come to an end, and America agrees. What does that say about you? What does that say about the guy who is now <laughs> the chief strategist? I think... Should Steve Bannon care that people are offended? No, um, because America has been ruled for 30 years by people who are too worried about what other people feel, not what other people think and too worried about feelings versus facts. For decades, America has been run by the Grievance Brigade, by social justice warriors, hand-ringers, feminists, Black Lives Matter, all these groups that are preoccupied with feelings first and facts later. They spread pr you know, conspiracy theories and propaganda about the wage gap, campus rape culture. This stuff isn't real. What does it and say about you, though? What does it, it say about Steve Bannon, who's now chief strategist, that you don't care about offending disabled people, ethnic minorities, women? You don't care about that. I don't care he about He doesn't care about that. I care about facts. I don't care about your feelings. But I thought you believed in a post-fact universe. So who? That's one of your quotes. Is it? What's we live in a post-fact era. It's wonderful, you said. Yes, what, what I meant from that was um, just telling the facts are no longer enough. You now have to be persuasive and charismatic and interesting and funny. Just telling people things isn't enough anymore. Milo Yiannopoulos talking to me earlier.
I'm joined now from New York by Versha Sharma, who's the managing editor of the Now This news organisation. Uh, Versha Sharma, have Liberals got the right idea about how to take the alt-right on? Um, I mean, I think that there's a lot of room for improvement in terms of how liberals and progressives are going to take on the Trump presidency. I think that there's a lot of reckoning to be done in terms of how the media in the U.S. especially covered this campaign, given the results. But I just want to point out that I think the new alt-right argument, as exemplified by Milo there, is basically toss all the names that you can that you're thrown at and just say, oh, it's actually the other side that's doing them without actually answering for any of the many headlines that you mentioned. He says it's all a big joke, though. It's all a big wind up and that, you know, liberal people are falling into this trap of getting wound up by them. I mean, I have to say it's not about liberals getting wound up, but it's about liberals calling out racism, sexism, misogyny, fear of the other when they see it. So to Milo, he may think that what Breitbart is doing is satire. But, you know, a couple of weeks after nine black people were gunned down in a church here in Charleston, South Carolina, Breitbart, under Steve Bannon's leadership, published an article saying this is why you should raise the Confederate flag high and proud. So that's not satire. That's actually something and that is a, a real problem in America when you're encouraging sort of white supremacist ideas when black people are being shot. Mm. I, mean, I mean, it has to be said, though, that your news organization didn't reach the people who voted for Trump, and Trump carries on tweeting and reaching those people directly. What do you do about that? That's true. And I think that we're having an honest conversation in our newsroom and with other news newsrooms in America where we talk about how we break outside of that social media echo chamber. Part of the problem is we don't have full control of how Facebook delivers our content, but we're trying to make sure that we're doing everything in our editorial power to reach out to broader audiences as well. Do you think that Trump's new chief strategist, Steve Bannon, the, the Breitbart chairman, is the bogeyman that he's been painted as. I mean, Jewish employees have been lining up to um, defend him against allegations of anti-Semitism for, for a start. Right, and I understand that their argument is because he hires Jews, he can't possibly be an anti-Semite, but you also have to look at the facts, despite what Milo and others say. And the facts are that in court under testimony, his wife said that Bannon didn't want his children going to school with Jews, that he didn't like seeing books about Hanukkah in the school library. And regardless of whether or not you know, Bannon has personal feelings toward Jewish people. The more important point of discussion is, are they supporting policies that exclude these people? Are they playing into anti-Semitic tropes in their advertisements and their talks of a global conspiracy? Um, well, and are they basically making Breitbart a home for some of these people who believe these things? Well, Steve Bannon did send his kids to that school and he denies all allegations of anti-Semitism. But, I mean, how do you in a news organisation deal with what the likes of Milo call this post-truth universe? How, when there's all these fake news stories out there, what do you do? It's difficult, but I think that what journalists have to remember is we are there to inform audiences. So we have, you know, despite whatever the American public may be feeling or the alt-right may be feeling, we do have an, uh, an obligation to tell the truth and to back up our arguments with facts. So I think that, you know, we need to maybe lessen some of our tones in terms of trying to call out other people, but just calling them out with the facts. So one of, one of the videos that we did at Now This was, OK, here's Steve Bannon in his own words. We're not telling you how to feel about him. We're presenting things that he said over the years about women, even about the current Republican Party, about how he wants to completely tear down the establishment in America. Um, and it's not just us or liberals or progressives who's doing it. There are a lot of Republicans and moderates who are fearful of Bannon as well. Glenn Beck, John Weaver. These yep. are high profile conservative voices calling him out. Versha Sharma, thank you very much for joining us. John. Now, the man on trial for the murder of the Labour MP, Joe Cox, walked away like he didn't have a care in the world after the attack, the old Bailey has heard. Thomas Mayer is accused of shooting and stabbing the MP before her constituency surgery, in front of her constituency surgery in Bristol, West Yorkshire, in June. David Honeywell, who'd come to see Joe Cox, said he saw a man stand over her, cock his gun and blast her before calmly walking away. 
the government has withdrawn plans to restrict the House of Lords' ability to block legislation. A review earlier this year by the Conservative peer Lord Strathclyde recommended stripping peers of their right to veto statutory instruments. This followed a defeat for David Cameron over his government's plans to cut the credits in, in tax credits in October 2015. But today, the government announced it had no plans to change the law ahead of Brexit. After the break, he first came to fame as a punk poet in the late 1970s, several years before she was even born. We bring together the two British performance poets of their generations, John Cooper Clark and Kate Tempest. They're performance poets who have each won over armies of fans more used to rock and pop than poetry, but while Kate Tempest's new album is a hip-hop-influenced political poem, John Cooper Clarke's new album with the former Stranglers frontman Hugh Cornwell has him singing classic songs from the 1950s. We brought them together to talk about how and why they got into all this in the first place. Round the block, against the clock, a tick tock, tick tock, tick tick tock. I always wanted to make it somehow as a poet, you know, in sort of ja jazz clubs. There were a lot of cabaret places in Manchester. Anywhere where, you know, there was a few minutes to spare, really. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, they give us a break. And, but very few places uh, where, you, where you could guarantee that the audience was interested in poetry. <laughs> What I'm trying to say is I didn't get no encouragement as, a, as an up-and-coming young professional poet. Did you get any encouragement? I was writing lyrics for music, really. That, ah, right. That's how it all began. And um, then I discovered, or I was taken to this, this poetry night by a friend of mine. He said, there's this thing happening. Uh, you should come and do your lyrics and you just do them a cappella and you could win a £100 prize money. It was, it was a poetry slam. I'd never seen it before. I'd never seen people standing up, you know, telling poems. The, the encouragement of it was that suddenly there was a whole scene, like, and that after that, attending that event, I met a lot of poets in that room who, who then invited me down to other nights that they were doing. But, well, that's it, Kate, you said. There is a world of poetry yeah. now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas that didn't exist, really, when I was doing what I do, I guess. The stuff that I was writing anyway, I realised I didn't need a band or a DJ to perform it. I could just go and just do it in a room full of people. But we weakly willed, we'll cry tears when we hear that the beast is killed. All the past just disappears into the, the present. Oh, yeah, it's the most important thing in the world the while it's going on, sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Then it's, yeah and I noticed that on, uh, on, on, uh, on the uh, Rivoli Ballroom thing uh, last week on telly. And she had a planet so dangled around it and held in that intricate dance. There is our Earth. Our Earth. So were these lyrics that you used to sing? Yeah, I mean, kind of. They were written to be, <clears throat> to be wrapped over music. Mm. The integrity of the lyric was always the thing that led me first. Not so much how it fitted into the music, but the music was just inherent. The beat was just inherent right, in me yeah. anyway. Probably very similar with you, like, what, your, your rhythm is so strong. No rehab, no repentance, heaven and hell in the same sentence. A poem is always, for me, a, 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 if not a musical experience, then a phonetic one. You know, I don't believe that poetry, I believe that poetry was sort of meant to be heard. When the mist rising and the rain is falling and the wind... I always take a bit of the car on stage with me, you know, whatever's been going on in the car, get into that town. I like to take some of it on there and, and, and you know, get something, some mileage out of it, yeah. you know. You like that. Yeah, everything that's <laughs> happened in the day, everything that's happened yeah. the night before, what, it ten all minutes out. ago? Yeah. I, I find that the same poem means a completely different thing. The same set of lyrics means completely different things in yeah. different environments, you know, when you're... It does to me, you know, sometimes I, I've never thought of a line and it's... Uh, I t well, I tell you what, I never stopped altering them. Yeah. Fifteen years later. Yeah. It's never finished, only abandoned, Kate. 
I hope you've enjoyed our Channel 4 News. <laughs> that is Channel 4 News. Good evening. Good evening.